welcome everyone to the compost research and natural capital accounting in agriculture webinar with Jim Redford. And I'd like to acknowledge the sponsors of this program, uh, Macedon Rangers, Shire Council, Hepburn Shire Council, City of Greater Bendigo, Melbourne Water, uh, the uh, Healthy Colburn Catchment, which is Colburn Water and North Central CMA, and the Upper Capacity Land Care Group. And in particular, thank the support of the Latrobe University, uh, uh, which pays Jim's bills. So that's, uh, that's the important part. Uh, before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the lands in which we meet today. For me, it's Yaj Gawarang, and I want to pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. I also want to pay respect to anyone that's joined us today of Aboriginal Torres Strait Island descent, or who will be watching uh, this recording. I also want to pay my respects to those people which uh, are joining us today from other lands, uh, and also or watching the recording. Uh, thank, uh, I want to pay my respects to their uh, and pay uh, particular respect to their elders, past, present, and emerging. This uh, pro, this is one of the uh, webinars as part of the Healthy Landscapes Practical Regenerative Communities Program, and it's um, we'll listen to a presentation for, from Jim, and then uh, we'll have a Q and A session, and then at the end we'll have an unrecorded session of. Q&A of about 15 minutes uh, or so. So uh, without any further ado, I'll hand it over to you, Jim. Uh, oh, I think I've cracked, have I pushed the right button? Yep. Yeah, no, that's good. <laughs> no worries. Uh, thank you, Jason. If you could just give me a thumbs up when you see my yep, um, slide, good. that's great. Um, thanks, everybody, and thank you very much for, for joining, taking some time out of your Tuesday evening to uh, tune in. Really appreciate that. Um, like Jason, I'm coming to you this evening from Jajarung country in central Victoria, and so I'd also like to pay my respects to uh, elders past, present and emerging. As Jason said, I'm, I'm from La Trobe University. Um, I'm a principal research fellow at the Research Centre for Future Landscapes. We have a, an agenda to look for solutions and, and uh, try and address the impacts of um, underlying broad scale landscape change and, and find solutions for a more sustainable future, particularly for nature, but also in agricultural landscapes. I'm, a, I'm an ecologist, a fauna ecologist and, a, and an ornithologist, a bird, a bird scientist by training. So a lot of what I'm presenting tonight is I'm learning about too. Um, it's not my actual natural environment, if you like, my natural habitat, um, but I was drawn to it um, and interested in the, in the subject matter that come to it uh, with a, an, an ecological background, I suppose. So just a bit of context for me there. So tonight I'm going to be talking to you about two very different projects, although they're, they're both uh, centred around uh, sustainability in agriculture. Um, the first one is a, a trial um, around the use of regenerative organic compost and timed grazing in dry land, um, agri in dry land grazing pastures. And the second, an introduction to a large scale, uh, farm scale natural capital accounting project that I lead. Okay. Doesn't want to go down. There's a bit of a delay. There we go. So the first project, um, it's called the effect of, of recycled organic compost on time grazing and soil properties in dry land pasture. And this was funded through DELP, uh, by DELP through their virtual center for climate change innovation. So I'd like to acknowledge their funding and the project is close to being finished um, after some, quite a few COVID delays. I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators uh, at La Trobe on the project, uh, Dr. Jim Wood, Professor Ashley Franks and Josh Vito and Lynn Kelson from the Green Cocky has been instrumental in this project from the outset, as well as our other uh, project partners down there, Biomix who provide the compost and support, uh, DELP as I said, and the Golden Broken uh, CMA. So, oh, wrong one, um, here we go. The basic premise of, of this project um, is that soil carbon sequestration, uh, well, both soil carbon sequestration, soil, sorry, both the, the addition of recycled organic compost and timed grazing or rotational grazing or holistic grazing, as it's sometimes called, are both advocated as regenerative agricultural practices. They're quite commonly applied to some extent across the uh, different properties across the, the, the globe um, and are 
uh, presumed to have benefits for soil condition, soil structure and soil carbon. And the key mechanism by which that occurs is on the, on the left hand side of the screen here. Um, and it's soil carbon sequestration is a key mechanism through which uh, greenhouse gas emissions can be reduced by the removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere by plants in the first instance um, through photosynthesis, drawing down carbon dioxide, embedding it in their, their plant tissue material, but also in their roots. And then that sloughing off and decomposing and either being trapped in the soil as, as uh, in a solid form or being taken up by soil microbes and soil fauna um, and being uh, inculcated into the soil uh, so profile in the soil structure that way. So this project was to try and test the effectiveness of these two mechanisms. So the addition of recycled organic compost, and in this case, it's from household green waste. So it's not a manure based compost, it's a household green waste. Um, and the addition of a timed or a rotational grazing as strategy to see, strategies to see if we can increase soil carbon uh, in the soil and in, or at least improve soil biology and soil structure in dry land pastures of Northern Victoria. So our working hypothesis was like this, that with the addition of these two strategies, we would stimulate biological activity in the soil. The existing microbes are there, not really adding carbon or adding microbes to it, but stimulating the existing fauna that's in the soil, help improve soil structure that way, improve water infiltration rates and soil moisture retention in the soil, which we hope will lead to increased primary productivity if the plants increase photosynthesis, um, improve um, I beg your pardon, uh, increase decomposition rates or sloughing of, of plant material into the soil and facilitate microbial associations, uh, lead to an increased abundance of soil microbes, increased abundance and diversity and functional diversity of soil microbes, which in turn leading to increased respiration, which of course releases CO2, but we're hoping that it's being offset by a greater rate of primary productivity of photosynthesis so that the net effect is uh, an increase in the soil structure, improvement in soil structure, soil health and soil carbon. That's the theory. And if successful, this has the potential to mitigate climate change through increasing soil carbon sequestration and through reducing emissions uh, in two ways. Firstly, through the diversion of waste from landfill and, and the methane emissions associated with that, and through potentially decreasing fertilizer use if the compost can replace it to some extent. And as we all know, fertilizer use, synthetic fertilizer use, has a very high uh, greenhouse gas footprint through the release of nitrous oxide. It also potentially helps farmers adapt to climate change by, as we say, improving soil moisture and pasture quality and allowing uh, better growth into dry times or for longer periods into extended dry, thereby increasing the resilience of farmers to climate extremes and climate variability. So that's if it works. So what did we do? So on each of our five, five, uh, our five trial farms that you can see here, hopefully, in the yellow stars in central Victoria, three over here near Stanhope, uh, Kyabram, one north of Bendigo and one west of Bendigo, um, we added compost. So on each farm, there was about a seven hectare trial plot. Why is my screen not advancing? There we go. Um, and we divided this up basically into 18 separate cells. So we, the, the colours on this plot represent the three grazing trials. So the mauve here was just business as usual. And in most cases, that was a set stocking, continuous grazing regime. These are all cattle properties, by the way, dry land cattle properties. So one was one's a dairy, um, but the other four were beef, beef cattle properties. So continuous grazing, business as usual in the mauve. A no grazing, we fenced this out. A no grazing control it wasn't grazed for the duration of the trial. And the green is where we applied the timed grazing uh, treatment, which is a a large number of head of stock for a relatively short period of time. We're talking two, three, four days, um, if, if not less, hitting it hard with as many cattle as we can to, to reduce the uh, biomass down to um, yeah, just above this, well, not just above, but retaining a, a fair amount of, of grass, but um, uh, certainly allowing a, a good nutritional intake for the cattle, but allowing the, the plants to retain that vitality and, and to, and to regrow regrow quickly. Um, there is a long rest period involved in that as well, which is critical. So they're the three grazing trials and crossed against that, depicted by these little squares, are where we applied the compost in three, um, three lane ways, if you like. So compost was added here, 
no compost, compost added here, no compost and compost. So compost was applied in the end to half of the plot at a rate of five tonnes per hectare um, in May, Norton, 2019, and then again in spring 2019, but at a rate of eight tonnes per hectare the second time. Um, so we then sampled these farms on six different occasions, each, each cell on each of the five farms. So soil samples were taken from five different points and then pulled um, uh, within each cell. We undertook uh, um, vegetation cover, uh, soil moisture, um, bare ground, litter cover, those sorts of measurements um, at, at, at different times. Now, not, we didn't undertake, we didn't record all those variables at each of those six survey times, um, but they, they're the various times that we did sample. So first one was before we applied any of the treatments. The second one was one week after the first compost application then one month after the first compost application, then a month before the second one, which is about six months, five, six months after the first one, then a month after the second application, and our plan was to take the last sample in around about April 2020. But of course, we all know that, that COVID hit then, we weren't able to get out of the city um, for those, those that had to do so. And we weren't allowed to get into the labs, even if we could get the sample. So we had um, some delays until the end of last year when uh, we were able to get out and do the sampling for the last time. In actual fact, that delay is probably good for the project, allowed longer time for the, for the treatments to take effect. So what does that actually look like? Well, rough, the roughly 20 to 30 tonnes of, of uh, compost were delivered uh, to each farm on the back of the semi-trailer and then loaded up into a spreader. The spreader spread it out in those laneways that I showed you before. And you'll note that it's quite dusty. It's quite a dry, thin, um, dusty compost. It's not a thick mulch like we might put on our garden. Um, and if there was a wind blowing, there was a risk that some of that compost would sort of blow away and either blow to where it wasn't supposed to go into the no compost treatment or off the farm entirely. So there was a, a small amount of loss, but by and large, the vast majority of it dumped straight out of the back of the trunk, truck to where it was supposed to go. Um, as I said, it's not a heavy mulch, just a thin layer, thin dusting of compost across the soil. So this is a, an area of, of, of pasture um, where it has just been laid, just, just after the compost has been dumped on it, and you can hardly see it at all. However, it is visible from the sky. So this is a photograph from a drone, and you can basically, you can sort of just see the darker area here where the compost has just been um, deposited, as opposed to the, the no compost area. So that's the method, that's what we did. Um, what did we find? So let's jump straight to the end game, if you like, straight to what was soil or total organic carbon percentage showing us. Now, a bit of a, uh, a caveat at the start, as, as scientists uh, uh, tend to do, is that we really didn't expect to see much change in total organic carbon over that length of time of, of simply 18 months to two years. Um, we know that uh, Organic carbon is very slow to build up in soil. So any change that we would see, we, we, we expected would be over a longer time period than that. And we were hoping that through our microbial analysis of bacteria and fungi, we might be able to pick up some change in microbial activity, which would then infer would lead to changes in soil organic carbon. So in some ways I'm going to the end game here first and we're having a look at seeing what happened with uh, soil organic carbon, but our expectations were fairly modest to say the least um, coming into this. So what have we here? This is uh, the time of the, of the sampling of, of our project. Um, these straight dashed lines here represent the uh, two episodes of adding the compost to, to each of the farms. The grayed out block here is roughly when the timed grazing treatment, the grazing treatment effects came into, a, came into effect. So as you will recall, early 2019 through winter 2019, we were coming out of a drought. It was a very dry period. Basically, all of our farms didn't have enough pasture, didn't have enough grass in these paddocks um, for there to be uh, cattle in there. So there was no grazing whatsoever in these paddocks in this early part of the project. It wasn't until we got some winter, late winter, spring rains, and depending on the farm, and it varied between farms, cattle were reintroduced to those paddocks in both the business as usual and the time grazing um, paddocks, uh, roughly from about September, October, November onwards and then reasonable uh, rains and reasonable moisture through 2020 enabled those practices to continue. Um, so this is for all five sites pulled, and this is total organic carbon uh, on, on this axis here, and each line represents one of those six different treatments. So the blue lines are where we um, didn't add compost, and the orange lines are where we did add compost, and the different 
darkness, if you like, uh, from light blue through to heavy dark blue represent the three grazing treatments. The lighter color, the lighter orange and the lighter blue are the business as usual. The very dark ones are where we introduce the time grazing regime and the ones in between are the, are the um, no grazing controls. So when we analyzed all of these farms together, all four or five farms together, um, there was no significant, no detectable effect of the addition of compost or the implementation of a timed grazing regime on soil organic carbon percentage. We can see that time two was very significantly different. It was quite lower right across the board. And this reflects seasonal effects that were our only sampling period in the middle of winter. Um, it was, as I said, at a very dry period. Winter species that tend to be these mostly annuals, as I said, so it tends to be relatively uh, dormant if there's not a rainfall event to, to stimulate them. Um, and that, as our theory suggests, means that we'll probably have fewer, um, uh, less, soil, uh, less carbon in the soil. Um, but this was before the application of a grazing treatment and just a month after the application of the soil, the first application of compost. So this dip here is, is a seasonal effect and, and um, nothing really to, to, to get too excited about. As I said, we, it's largely to be expected because we, we know that soil carbon is very slow to accumulate and slow to change. However, when we look at it, disaggregate it and look at it on a farm by farm basis, a couple of other things become very obvious. Firstly, there was a huge amount of variation in the background levels of soil organic carbon. So this, this farm, in fact, this is pretty typical of these three farms over here near, near uh, Stanhope Kyabram. The background level, the average level of carbon is roughly about three and a half percent in the in the soil. And for the Bendigo and the Arnold one, it's roughly at about one and a half percent. So this very different uh, background level, the different management uh, practices leading up to this trial, um, the different pasture types and the different uh, uh, management practices during the trial, subtle differences, uh, probably not surprising that when we mush it all together, we don't see any uh, any signal. Now, when we analyse each farm separately, there was a strong effect of time on all five farms. And as I mentioned, this is the seasonal variation, probably associated with soil moisture that we expected to see. There was also on this one farm, farm one, excuse me, a marginally or nearly significant effect of the addition of compost, as we can see on this graph. So remember that the compost cells are these orange ones. And at the start of the trial, they're middling to low uh, in their ranking for this particular farm. And by the end of the trial, uh, they're certainly in the higher, they're the two highest ones and, and three of the four highest, highest um, soil, soil carbon. So there's a bit, of an, a bit of an indication and there's a bit of a trend there that throughout the, the course of the project, they are starting to, to increase relative to where the compost was not added on this one particular farm. Now, there was no significant effect of the addition of compost on any of the other four farms. So again, just tempering the, the excitement of an effect there. And there was no effect, main effect of the grazing treatments on soil carbon on any of the individual farms. Now for four out of the five farms though, there was a significant interaction between time, uh, the, the time of sampling and grazing. So what this means is that the rank order um, of soil carbon percentage among those three grazing regimes uh, changes over time. So they're switching around. And we can see it here on, in, time, in farm one. Uh, it also happened in farm four, but we just can't see it because of the scale, where gradually they're reordering themselves such that the timed grazing, uh, the timed grazing treatment moves from either the middle or the, or the lower part of the uh, lower levels of soil carbon for that, for that compost treatment. Um, to, the, to the top, so it has more soil carbon. So by the end of the trial, and you can see it here in time in farm one, for those cells that either had compost added, the orange ones, or either didn't have compost added, the blue ones, the timed grazing regime is on top, the no grazing control is in the middle and the business as usual is at the bottom. Now, again, this is just a, an indication, a, a start. It's not, not a, a, a very solid conclusion, but there is an inkling um, that in fact the grazing may be having effect on, on soil carbon in this particular property, where I do know that the, uh, the time grazing regime was implemented very strictly and, and to good effect with large mobs for very short times. 
okay, so that was one of our key leading indicators. Another one was the amount of bare ground. Because we know that over the long term, we know that bare ground is associated or related to loss of soil carbon. We also know it's highly variable. Um, so we think that maybe this is a, a bit of a default or a surrogate for, for seeing what the long term effects of this might be. So what we have here is slightly different graph this time. Um, we only sampled bare, we only measured bare ground on three different occasions, one at the start of the project, one between the applications of compost and one at the end and at the end. And again, the same color coding as before, um, the blue bars represent the sites or the cells um, where compost was not added and the, and the orange ones where compost was added. And this is for all five farms combined and the amount of bare ground in those different cells with the different grazing regimes represented by the shading. So clearly, uh, at the start, it's roughly, there's no significant, there's no difference between the different treatment types as we would expect, and it's highly variable. It is highly variable throughout. There's a lot of variation between farms, which is, which is what you're detecting in these very large error bars associated with this. So we know that there's significant differences between farms, but there's also differences within farms. We know we're coming straight out of a drought in 2019 here. So relatively high, well, not too bad really at 10 or 10 or 15% bare ground. Um, but um, so these are quite well grassed properties. So clearly, as we get into the project and the treatments start to take effect here between applications and certainly by the end here, we can see that the amount of bare ground is highest as we would expect in the business as usual, in the continuous grazing cells. So that's represented by this blue bar and this light pink bar, or light beige bar, whatever color that is. So within the compost treatments, sorry, within the non-compost treatments, no grazing is highest bare ground. And even within the compost treatments, no grazing is highest bare ground. There's a bit of very, not much difference really between the no grazing control and the timed grazing on either one. We also see there's a bit of a, a bit of a, a trend. Um, uh, sorry, I got mixed up there, I think. There's, there, there's, there's lower, less bare ground where we added compost. So that's the comparison between these two, I beg your pardon. So in the no, in the business as usual, continuous grazing cells here where we added compost, there's less bare ground. Now this isn't the effect of the compost. So we're not, we're not recording the compost as I showed you, it's a very fine layer. What it is suggesting is perhaps there's more plant growth or more litter material on the ground. And the effect of grazing is apparent, as I said, with, with um, business as usual, having more bare ground than either the no grazing control or the timed grazing. And then within the timed grazing and within the no grazing and within the business as usual, when we added the compost, we have less, less bare ground by the time we get to the end of the, end of the project. And if we look at it on a farm by farm basis, we can see this pattern is, is largely um, reflected here, but, but uh, significantly a fair bit of noise early on, and then they're starting to sort themselves out. Um, so we see here again uh, that less bare ground where we've added compost to the same grazing treatment and less bare ground in the timed grazing and obviously in the no grazing control than in the, um, in the business as usual continuous grazing. So that's again, another positive uh, indication, a, a, a good sign that perhaps there is some uh, benefit uh, from, a, from a soil health and a soil carbon perspective through the application of these treatments. So a lot of graziers are very interested in the amount of pasture cover that they have on their properties because that's what feeds the, the, the cows in this case. So the corollary of bare ground in many cases is pasture cover. And this was just done through a, through a point count methodology. And this is just total plant cover. So there's no distinction here between pasture species and weeds, between perennials and annuals. We, we have some of that information. Hopefully we'll, we'll delve into it. But what I've just presented here is just the, the total, uh, total plant cover um, in each of these cells. Most of the species, as I said before, we encountered were, were annuals, barley, oats, and rye, and the like. Um, in some uh, properties, uh, there were there was lucerne, so perennials that were sown, um, and some subclover. And there was the odd um, perennial pasture, such as phalaris or windmill grass, and a few other perennial natives hanging on here and there. So again, at the start of the project down here, no difference between the treatments at all, as we would expect, and then. 
in this middle period, this is the pattern we expected to see with the highest amount of pasture cover in the no grazing controls, as we would expect, because there's no, nothing grazing it, um, more cover in the timed grazing and the lowest levels where there's, there's continuous access to the pasture from the stock. Um, and look, it's not significant, but there's a slight hint that within the, certainly within the known grazed and the timed grazing, that the levels of pasture are slightly higher where we added the compost. This is this one you've got to remember was only taken a month or so after the compost addition. Uh, sorry, no, it was taken about six months after the first compost, but before the second compost addition. So not really that long for those things to take effect. And we really only had some good rain a couple of months before we sampled here. By the end of the treatment, though, by the end of the, the study, uh, that effect has largely disappeared. And we're back to something that sort of resembles here uh, at the start of the treatment. So. We have got a bit of a stepwise decline within each of the treatments. In actual fact, pasture cover is lower in the timed grazing than in the non-grazed, than in the no compost, sorry, than in the business as usual. Where'd my point go? Here, when we, we don't have compost added and a similar pattern here. Um, now, we do know that we did sample this time shortly after a couple of the timed grazing events. So it's not surprising that cover was a bit lower in these time grazing um, cells because they just had a, a, a herd of cattle on, on them in a number of the farms. So not much to there. Um, I think we're not really looking at the effects of composition um, and taking that into account. It also doesn't, there's no measurement here of height of the pasture uh, and structure and composition. It's purely uh, the amount of hits, pasture cover, if you like, per cell. So that's enough of graphs. Um, what does it actually look like on the ground? Oh, that was per farm, which, sorry, got ahead of myself. Similar pattern there reflected um, on a farm by farm basis. And we can see here, lower pasture cover in the timed grazing in both farms and not much difference at all between the continuous and the no grazing, which is interesting in and of itself. But as I said, it's obviously the grass was much shorter uh, in the, uh, continuous grazing, as we will see here. So some fence line comparisons. This is a good visual way to show the difference. So this is from the, uh, the late 2020 sampling period. And on the left here is the no grazing control. And on the right here is the timed grazing um, at one of the farms. And you'll note that, yes, th there appears to be much less uh, grass. As I said, that was just after a, a grazing episode, but also it's very heavily trampled. And that's a key thing. It's not that the grass is just eaten and taken away. It's that a lot of the uh, organic matter is trampled into the surface of the soil. And so it improves the uh, well, deep, improves soil cover and litter cover, which reduces evaporative loss of, of soil, of moisture from the soil, and probably encourages the um, incorporation of the, the organic matter into the soil, which eventually becomes soil carbon. Whereas the business as usual over here, you can see there's still good cover, very good cover, but it's just grazed short compared to the no grazing. Unfortunately, I can't give you a side by side here of the timed grazing and the business as usual because they're on opposite sides of that of that cell that I showed you before. So that's in a, uh, a largely an annual pasture um, farm. And this one in the lucerne paddock, basically no visually no difference whatsoever, although um, as I showed you before, this is farm four. There is actually some difference in bare ground when we measure it very carefully. So that's the grazing comparisons. These are looking at the difference between where we added compost here in a no grazing control area and right next door, literally 15, to, well, probably about 50 metres away uh, in another no grazing control where we added compost um, for farm in farm one and to the naked eye, no difference. And in fact, that was... Um, uh, largely reflected in the graphs as well, where there didn't really appear to be that much difference between whether we added compost or not in the ground cover. And in a different grazing treatment for the time grazing in the, in the lucerne pastures, uh, similarly compost added here and a little way away, see the difference there, it's the same tree in the background, uh, no compost added and to the naked eye, very little difference in structure and cover. As I said, when we measure it carefully, um, there is some subtle differences in, in uh, bare ground. So 
when we look at soil bacteria, so one of the strengths of Latrobe is the microbial environmental, so the environmental microbiology labs. And so we do a lot of soil analysis, soil microbial uh, work. And uh, we're looking here at the bacteria community. I'll explain these plots in a second. Um, and we also do fungal analysis. So what we see here, each different color represents a different farm. Each point represents a sample, one of those 18 cells per farm. And the points that are closer together are more similar in the, in the bacterial community that we sampled from that cell, whether it was grazed or ungrazed or had compost added or not, um, and the different colors of the different farms. So points close together are similar, points further away are more different in the number and, and the type of species uh, or functional groups that are, that are present in those samples. And so this is just from the first sampling period, so before, um, uh, before we applied any of the treatments. And what we detected was a significant effect of um, farm on, on the bacterial community composition and their metabolic pathways. Essentially, each farm has its own bacterial fingerprint. They're, they're each unique in their own way. So it's not surprising that when we looked for differences due to grazing or compost, we didn't see any because there's significant differences between um, uh, between farms. Now we wouldn't have seen any, we hoped we wouldn't have seen any at this point anyway, because this was before we applied any of the treatments. So that was a good thing. So when we do it again, um, when we do it again at time three, which was between the first and the second um, applications, um, again, there was no significant difference of the grazing treatments, which had only been in operation for a couple of months on some on the farms or the, uh, or the compost, the first edition of compost. And again, that's hardly surprising. There was on this farm three, um, some evidence that the timed grazing sites represented in blue here, are slightly separate, slightly different to the no grazing control and the continuous grazing. Um, but I suspect that that's uh, largely a, a random effect. Um, the timed grazing had really hardly taken place at that point and um, hadn't really had time to have a chance to have an effect. So when we did it again, at the end of the um, time period, at the end of the, of the program, time six, there's still significant differences between properties, large significant differences between, prop between properties being driven by the presence or the absence of many different but largely uncommon um, types of bacteria. Now they, they talk about it in terms of metabolic pathways, but the types of bacteria, if you like species of bacteria, they're doing different things in the soil or different species are doing different things in the soil. Um, even though functionally they may be quite similar. So very, still very strong differences between farms as we would expect. So we looked at each farm on their own and in general, we still did not see an effect of either compost or grazing with two exceptions. On this farm, farm one, the timed grazing and the continuous grazing, so the timed grazing in, in blue and the continuous grazing in red, uh, were significantly different in their bacterial community uh, from the no grazing control but they weren't different to each other, the time from the continuous, which is what we would expect. So there's something going on when there's no, there's no cattle in there perhaps. And on this farm on F2, the timed grazing, the timed grazing in blue and the continuous grazing in red or pink um, were different to one another, but neither of them were different to the no grazing control in the middle. So again, this is not really a pattern we would expect. And this was similar to an underlying pattern that was evident at this farm in times three and one. So I suspect it's just a, an underlying effect of the different soil types and, and micro variation at the farm rather than a treatment effect. So somewhat disappointingly, our, our global analysis did not identify any bacterial metabolic pathways or communities that were, that were different across the farms due to grazing or compost nor were there any significant differences detected due to those treatments on individual farms when we looked at it at a farm by farm basis. So when we looked at the soil fungi, um, we saw significant differences in fungal community composition between sampling times, either when all farms were pulled or when we did it on a farm by farm basis, but few signals or strong effects of either of the treatments. Um, either grazing or compost when we when we looked at it um, uh, similarly as we as I've just shown you for the bacteria when we looked at community composition as a whole. 
except at time six. So the last sampling period where there was a significant main effect of grazing. So significant differences in the fungal community between those sites that had undergone timed grazing, no grazing, or uh, were continuous business as usual grazing, irrespective of whether we had added compost or not. So a main effect on its own. And this is mainly driven by uh, differences at a couple of farms at farm four, where timed grazing was very different to the other two treatments. Um, and at time three, where time grazing again was very different to the business as usual, which is sort of, sort of in the direction, uh, the patterns that we would expect to see. So what we did then, okay, so there's differences in the community, but what does that mean? What does it mean for function, um, for, for uh, the, the soil biology and soil functioning? So we did, a, and this is all through genetic analysis, by the way, I didn't mention that because that's not my area, but it's all undertaken with genomic analysis put the cell samples through the machines that go ping and they spit out a great big long list of species that are present in their relative abundance in each soil sample. And then you do some fancy bioinformatics to, to come up with these sorts of um, uh, analysis, which are different functional groups. Now, these are fairly imposing uh, names of different groups. We can go through a couple of them and we can look for differences within those functional groups between different um, uh, contrast, different treatment contrasts on a farm by farm basis. So this first fun functional group of dung saprophytes, uh, saprotrophs, beg your pardon, and soil saprotrophs. So these are these are fungi that are associated with the breakdown of, of, of dung and manure. Um, no difference between the compost in any of the compost treatments um, on any of the farms. Uh, on farm four, this group of fungi were more common uh, in where there was no grazing than where there was timed grazing. And they were also more common where there was business as usual than timed grazing. So they're lower in the timed grazing. Now, again, so this possibly represents the fact that there's less dung uh, in the, in the, in the timed grazing area, but this is surprising that um, uh, it was higher in the, in the no grazing area where there hadn't been any, any stock for, for a number of months. So again, a slightly perplexing result. Um, well, let's have a look at this arbuscal uh, mycorrhizal group, which are associated with plant vigor and plant vitality and plant growth. And again, at a couple of farms, we saw a significant difference associated with grazing treatment. Um, they were lower in the no grazing than in the business as usual, and they were also lower in the time grazing than in the business as usual. So perhaps the continuous grazing where the, where the, grass, the pastures are being continually munched on is, is stimulating that growth or they need that, that um, fungal association to continue to grow. Some of these wood saprophytes, which tend to be associated with decomposition of, of, um, of uh, dry material or dead matter, um, are higher in the composting treatments and higher uh, in, where there's no grazing than in the time treatment, and the time grazing treatment, um, and lower in the time grazing treatment here than in the, in the business as usual. So you can see there's, there's, there's a lot to unpack here and to untangle. Um, but it's it's quite it's giving some quite mixed and quite ambiguous sort of results. But I think maybe with time there, there's there is some pattern starting to come through. So our key results, we saw a marginally significant increase in soil carbon with the addition of compost on one of our five farms, farm one. I think there was an indication that the timed grazing regime has the potential to increase soil carbon, um, irrespective of the addition of compost or not. Um, we saw this with some evidence from two of our five farms, and these were the two farms that implemented the time grazing control uh, to greatest effect, I would say, most strictly and most consistently. Bare ground was certainly lower in the timed grazing treatments and after the addition of compost, which again augurs well for soil carbon retention. So mixed results in pasture cover, generally higher in the business as usual continuous grazing. As I say, that's cover, not height or compositional structure. And we need to look further at that. We saw no effect of compost or grazing on bacterial composition whatsoever. We saw some differences in fungal uh, functional groups, but it was quite mixed in what we were picking up. And it was mostly associated with the grazing treatment rather than the compost treatment. Um, and we saw differences in some of those fungal functional groups uh, associated with more standing plant material in the no grazing controls, more active plant growth, perhaps in the, in the business as usual, continuous grazing and the time grazing, 
and the variable done loads associated with the different episodes of, of timed grazing. So what do we conclude about compost and its utility? For increasing soil carbon from our trials. Perhaps the lack of an effect of compost could have been due to the timing of the application. We were, we were, you know, we have project timelines to, to follow and that sort of stuff. And we didn't really have many follow, much follow-up rain after the, um, after the uh, uh, second application, certainly. We actually lucked out the first time and got a good dump of rain after the first one, but the second one was, was quite dry after our, our compost application. So if you were able to better predict that or able to manipulate that some way to wet it down, to get increase your soil moisture so that you get a better um, infiltration or better incorporation of the compost into the soil, we might have seen a more significant effect. So that's, I think, certainly a, a significant or a potential reason why we saw very little effect of the compost. Our rate of application was quite low, five tonnes per hectare and then 18 tonnes per hectare is quite low. So in, in horticultural and, and uh, cropping situations where they use uh, this compost, they generally put it on at, at rates of around about 20 tonnes per hectare. Now, we were trying to do this at something that might be sensible to do for a dry land grazer who's going to apply it over a much larger area if they were going to take this up as a practice than somebody who's got a vineyard or, a, or an orchard. So that's why our application rate was much lower because we still need to take into account the cost benefit analysis of, of applying the uh, compost. We said that if we had applied it at a, at a higher rate, maybe we might have seen a, a, a uh, we might have seen more of an effect. As I mentioned at the outset, there's a chance that some of the compost blew off the treatments. It wasn't on all the treatments equally. I, I don't think this is a significant effect. It would have only been a very small amount. Now, this was using recycled organic compost, essentially green waste. Most of the compost trials that have been done are using manure, chicken-based manure or pig manure, um, poultry manure and that sort of thing. So my quizzical look there, face there is to say, I don't really know, maybe this is, maybe this is a factor, maybe it's not. Jury is still out on this one a little bit. But this is the first sort of trial that I'm aware of, of, of using that green waste compost at a broad acre application. And certainly the results were mixed. Well, that could be a factor of it. We didn't do anything with it once we put it down. We just let it lie on the surface. We didn't come back over it and till it in or, or, or sew it in or, or do any, any post um, application treatment to it. Maybe there's something else we could have done there. Certainly it's not being deep ripped like the, the chicken manure trials are. So again, quizzical look, maybe with a different treatment we could we could look at that as well. Maybe we just didn't allow enough time to come to have elapsed. Um, and certainly we know soil carbon will, will um, take a long time to build up. I've put a quizzical face. I think it's probably a cross because we actually didn't see any effect in the, in the, um, the soil fauna, the bacteria and the fungi either. And I, I would have thought we might have seen that um, over that time period. Could just be that this compost doesn't work. Um, it's not really effective, uh, this type of compost in this treatment for, for this purpose jury is still out. I'm, I'm unwilling to put a line through it at this stage. I'm also unwilling to stake my reputation on it and say, this is the thing to do. Um, the, the results are quite mixed. Uh, there's some indications, some good uh, light at the end of the tunnel, but it's certainly not conclusive in any, in any uh, regard. Grazing. So what about the grazing treatments? Had clear impacts on bare ground cover, an indication of an effect on soil carbon percentage, and an indication that manipulating grazing can influence the fungal community composition and function, um, but there wasn't a strong consistent signal. So maybe this limited impact was because the grazing treatments weren't applied consistently across the five farms, and, and this certainly was the case uh, to a certain extent. Um, we did get stronger results from those farms that applied the grazing treatments more rigorously. I suspect that, that, that we couldn't get the stocking rate high enough um, on a number of the properties for it to have the, the uh, desired effect in terms of a rapid reduction in biomass without impacting on the soil roots. Again, I think we might need more time, not so much in the effect of what's gone before, but just to allow more grazing rotations to have an effect. And a lot of these pastures were quite uh, uh, poor in many ways. A lot of annual grasses, not a lot of perennial pastures in there. So maybe they need to be remediated first. They need a higher uh, higher perennial composition um, 
for the, those time grazing effects to really have an effect. That could also apply to the, the compost as well. Uh, a, a more stable perennial pasture is probably in a better, a better pasture to trial these applications to uh, for their impacts on soil carbon. So I suspect we may need to, if we if we'd done this in a on pastures that were uh, had a larger percentage of um, perennial and persistent uh, grasses, we might have seen a slightly different effect. So I think that there's good evidence that all of those uh, factors came into play here. And if we could, uh, if you could manipulate it such that you had a more consistently applied grazing treatment at a higher stocking rate over a, a larger number of rotations in a good quality perennial pasture, I suspect you might start to see some impacts of that grazing manipulation on bare ground, on community composition, and eventually on the soil fauna and the soil carbon. How are we going for time? Jason, I, I've got about 10 or 12 minutes to talk about farm scale natural capital accounting. Yep, keep going. Keep going, cool. Okay, switching tack can completely now. This is another different project that I'm, I, I lead um, with colleagues from a whole range of um, uh, partner organisations, particularly Sue Ogilvy from Integrated Futures, uh, David L Darby Laferla from Sensand Technologies, Angela Horton from Bush Heritage Australia, and Sam, Sam Marwood from Odonata Foundation. So this is a project that's funded through the uh, federal government's Smart Farming Partnership Program as part of the Landcare Program. Um, and it's called Farm Scale Natural Capital Accounting. These are our partner organisations um, along the body, at bottom here. So it's a uh, nine other organisations along with Latrobe involved in this project. So what do these companies have in common? They sell a variety of different products. Some are supermarkets, some sell apparel, others are entertainment organisations. Well, they all have publicly declared that they are going to operate more sustainably. That they're either going to source their products um, from uh, sustainable, um, sustainable sources, sustainable producers. They're going to go carbon neutral. They're going to go to renewable energy. They're all making a commitment to being more sustainable. These are large companies. Some are small, but many of them are large. And I could have put many others on here. It's becoming more and more common that corporates are having to go green. You will have seen the recent Coles ads. I was struck by these terms that, that came out at me when I first watched that Coles ad. And the Woolies one that's on now is very similar. It talks about farmer partnerships, about most sustainable supermarket, about having zero emissions, responsibly sourced seafood, responsibly sourced this, sustainable that. So Coles is very clearly, very definitely, as is Woolworths, as is everybody else, getting a signal from their consumers, from their customers, that they need to be more sustainable. Coles aren't doing this because it's more profitable for them. They're doing this because there's consumer demand. Their stakeholders are saying, we want to see you, we, we don't want to have that impact on the stuff that we buy from you. So their consumer demand is making sure that in this instance, Coles, I'm not picking on Coles, it's just that the ad was fresh in my mind when I put this together, all those other companies are the same. They need a social license to operate. And more and more, that is coming through being able to show that they're sustainable, that they've got a low carbon footprint, they've got a low biodiversity impact where they can, um, and that they're operating more sustainably. So Coles want a social license to operate. So they're applying pressure on their suppliers, who they buy their products from, to produce those products, those agricultural products, more sustainably. That makes sense. A nice flow of, of pressures, if you like. So sustainable production is quite a nebulous concept. There aren't necessarily hard and fast definitions and rules and quantifications of it. We know it involves a space for biodiversity in nature in the landscape, making sure that there's public benefit services. Animal welfare is increasingly an important part of animal uh, sustainable production, as is equitable and responsible use of resources um, across the community. Um, including uh, downstream users of water resources, for example, including traditional owners and their use of resources, including public use of resources. So as you're producing um, your, your food or your fibre, you can't be greedily taking everything, particularly public benefit resources or, or, or um, uh, resources that are out in the, in, the, in the public domain and exclusively using them for your, your benefit. And included in that are things like biodiversity, like um, or uh, uh, 
air quality, water quality, and those sorts of things. So this is all great. It all makes sense. But how do producers show Coles and their other buyers and their other other uh, supply, their other buyers that they are actually producing stuff sustainably? Well, what if I could prove it to you? That's the farmer saying, what if I could prove it to you that I am able to produce my goods sustainably? And that's where natural capital accounting comes into the picture. And we think it is a tool that has the potential uh, to revolutionise uh, that supply chain dynamic and visibility and transparency in the supply chain. Essentially, it's a new way of measuring the environmental performance of farming and showing the, sustain the sustainability of agricultural products. So it's a whole of farm system of environmental economic accounting that's enabled in our case uh, by an integrated digital platform to generate what we're calling ecologically calibrated enterprise scale natural capital accounts. Now that's a mouthful, I'll now unpack that for you. So what is natural capital first of all? It's a bit of a flashy word, a bit of a buzzword, new term, um, but is essentially what underpins agricultural production, what underpins ecosystem services that, that we all benefit from. It's the stock of all renewable and non-renewable resources, basically the plants, the animals, the soil, the water, the air and the minerals that sustain, that sustain us. And combine, they combine in different ways to produce a yield of benefits that flow to people. Everything on this slide that you can see is natural capital of a different type. Everything that underpins a farm is natural capital. So natural capital accounting, like financial accounting, is basically just a set of rules. It's a set of concepts and methods, and in our case, coherent with the recently UN-endorsed system of environmental economic accounting, uh, that we use to, to quantify these natural capital resources and to estimate the contributions that they make uh, to a farm's production, to the economy more generally, and to society, the public benefits as a whole. So essentially accounting is just like financial accounting, a framework for quantifying what types of different natural capital a farmer might have on their property and what benefit they're, um, they're deriving from it and what benefit the public is deriving from it. We prepare our accounts in physical terms. So in terms of the area of a natural capital, uh, an area of a natural asset, I beg your pardon, and the contribution, the ecosystem service that it provides to the farm. And where we can, we're also trying to prepare them in monetary terms. What's the dollar value of that uh, remnant bush, what's the dollar value of that hectare of soil, what's the dollar value of that megalitre of water uh, to the, the, not just the production side of things, but to um, the physical condition and the benefit of those ecosystem services that, that flow to uh, a whole range of, of stakeholders, if you like. Now, our project, now, natural capital accounting can be done at all sorts of scales, from global scale to, to national, regional catchment scale. Our project is unashamedly being prepared specifically at the farm scale, at an enterprise scale. So a farmer can say, this is my accounts, this is my impact on natural capital, this is, my, this is what natural capital is contributing to my farm to produce my, uh, and my products every year. So this is natural capital in an agricultural context. So this is a typical, very varied farm, and most farms will have some or all of this. It might um, be all sorts of different biological and ecological assets on the farm. So starting from the, the soil and water that, that are the foundation of all farming systems, it includes the, the, um, the assets on the farm include the fence and the infrastructure, obviously, but the natural capital also includes the pastures and uh, that, that the livestock are feeding on and the crops, any riparian vegetation, it includes the water and the in-stream uh, uh, in uh, ecosystem that's there, it includes shelter belts, you might have scattered mature remnant trees in, in a paddock, bits of a remnant uh, habitat and the biodiversity that's associated with it. So all of these are biological and ecological assets that are on a farm that um, contribute to its production. Um, uh, and farms work with these concepts and these, and these elements every day. So in traditional financial accounting, this is all that's visible from that farm. The tractor, the infrastructure, the fences, the livestock, the crops, um, uh, the, the, the plant and equipment, um, some uh, measure of impairment for, for uh, uh, depreciation of that equipment as well. Um, obviously, the products themselves, the fruit or the crops or the livestock or the, the fibre that's taken off is, is incorporated into the traditional accounts as income. Um, but this is the other part 
of the farm that's completely invisible at the moment. These are all the ecological assets that we were talking about that actually supply a lot of the services that grow the, the, the crops, that grow the pastures, that feed the livestock, that produce the food and the fibre. And these are the invisible ecological assets that natural capital accounting wants to put on the, on the books. So we know that many of these assets, like shade and shelter trees in, in, in uh, pastures for livestock, like the forage that, that the livestock feed on, whether that's uh, native pastures or exotic pastures, um, the soil that produce composting functions that feed the soil biology, um, worms and that sort of thing, and the microbes that we were just talking about that, uh, uh, that the, the crops and, and pastures need to grow. Um, all of these things are good for private benefit of the farmer in this case. Habitat for beneficial insects that do pest control or pollination, decomposition, waste decomposition, get rid of the dung and dead lambs and what have you. So that, all those are good for public benefit. And there's a whole bunch of other ecological assets on a farm that also have public, sorry, those ones are good for private benefit. There's a whole lot of public um, ecological assets that also have a public benefit. So the riparian habitat provides protection for waterways from leaching from soil, better water quality, better um, riverine health. Uh, habitat here conserves biodiversity, provides wildlife for habitat that we all benefit from because we see, we like to see birds and we like to know that there's animals out in the, in the, in the landscape. The trees and the, the shelter belts and the pastures do store and sequester carbon, which we know is critical in combating climate change, a, a massive public benefit. So a whole bunch of things that have public benefit good as well as private benefit good. So we call these joint benefits. So a lot of these things are good for the farmer and they're good for um, public benefit up to a point. But there is a point at which too much of some of these wouldn't be so good for, um, uh, for, for the private benefit. And that's where the public has to, or, or the government has to step in and set up schemes in order well, to encourage uh, landholders to do more than what they might want to do for their own private benefit good. So through uh, going above and beyond the production optimum, if you like, to store and sequester carbon, to provide habitat for biodiversity and for, to protect waterways. And that's only because we've overdrawn on the natural capital as a whole on the, in the landscape. We've lost too much of that biodiversity. We've, we've taken out too much vegetation that enables um, us to store and sequester carbon. We've, we've damaged our waterways. So we've drawn down, we're in the red on our natural capital in these landscapes. And so as a society, we need to provide some incentive and benefit and payment to those custodians who are hopefully going to replenish that through management. And there may be a cost benefit, a cost factor associated with that in terms of loss production. We do acknowledge that there are some disbenefits. So some elements of natural capital provide a, a disbenefit for agricultural production. For example, they might harbour pests, rabbits or goats, feral predators and the like, as well as insect pests. So what natural capital accounting does is to measure and quantify the extent and condition of these different types of natural capital on a farm and through a whole range of different uh, models that we're developing, contribute, uh, measure the contribution that they make to the farm business, to the farmer and to the public good. So how do we do that? Firstly, we have quite a detailed map of the ecosystem types, the ecosystem assets on any given farm. Um, we derive that in the first instance from satellite imagery, and ground cover data, talking to the farmer, management inputs and those sorts of things to develop quite a detailed map of those ecosystem assets. We then use ground cover uh, information from Landsat or Sentinel data to um, identify sites on the ground that we're going to go and visit to validate that our that our initial representation, our initial mapping of the property is, is adequate. We then go and visit the farm in person, uh, send an ecologist out there to do the on-ground assessment to see how well what we think is there matches up what's on there and also to talk to the farmer. We collect a lot of operational data, historical data um, to um, adjust and manipulate where we need to uh, these initial classifications of ecosystem assets. We collect a whole bunch of farm management information as well, such as fertilizer use, um, fossil fuel use, electricity use, seed use, that sort of thing that, that goes into the farm operations and management side of things. Combined, we, we compile an asset register, and this is just a line by line physical, um, a line by line representation of the physical assets that are on a farm. So each 
of these little units in here on the farm is a line here to its area, its asset type, what its primary purpose is, what its production output is, and those sorts of things. And from this, we generate the accounts. So the basic account is, uh, here's an example, a mock-up example of um, the, the physical terms of the ecosystem asset account. So for the property as a whole, what are the different ecosystem types or the land use types, if you like, that are on that property? What's their extent uh, when we first measured it, in the first measuring period? And then you need to go back and measure it again for these accounts to have any value because they're really measuring the change in natural capital over a set time period. Um, so we can have agroforestry or we can have grassy woodlands in different condition states. These can be grazed, these can be producing um, input that comes out in another table. We can have native pastures or exotic pastures, could be horticulture, could be crops, uh, could be uh, plantations, anything that's in there, we can, we can assess in its physical terms. And then depending on the management that a farmer does, over any given period of time, we can track the change. So in this case, 39.4 hectares was changed from um, a, you know, poor quality exotic pasture. In this case, wasn't worth it. They changed it to, they uh, put it down to an agroforestry for, a, for some timber plantations in the future. So we see a change in the area there, or perhaps in this case, some cleared native um, naturalized pasture was, was put into a shelter belt to improve um, uh, to reduce wind erosion, soil erosion, improve shade and shelter um, ecosystem services. Through change grazing management, or maybe through the application of some fertilizers, uh, maybe we get a change in the, in the condition or the quality of different pastures, they improve in quality, um, or we get a, an improvement in the woodland condition through some management application. Now, all of these things will flow through here. So at not you don't see it in this table, but there'll be, you know, a correlational benefit for, you know, a uh, ton of, of, of crops that are produced under these different cropping area um, conditions, um, states, or the amount of livestock that can be produced um, given that natural capital condition state. And so through integrating that production data with our physical representation, sorry, our representation of the physical ecosystem states on a farm, we generate a whole set of, of natural capital accounts. And these accounts are essentially just tables of values of coming the uh, values of the farm. But they are standardized, verifiable, and repeatable methods to measure the stocks and flows in natural capital over time. So the fact that they're standardized, verifiable, and repeatable and and um, abide by a set of standard accounting practices is what makes it accounting similar to financial accounting. We recognize that we're going to need different types of accounts to measure different aspects of the environmental performance for the farm as its entirety. So our accounts include the production areas, they include any more, more natural areas, remnant areas, riparian areas, and anything in between. But any, so basically it's for an entire farm. It's a whole of farm uh, process that measures the ecological integrity, the soil condition, we, we give a greenhouse gas balance for the farm as a whole. Are you a net emitter or a net sequester of, of greenhouse gases based on your, uh, your soil types, your vegetation profile and your management of practices? We do a resource use efficiency measure. So for each kilogram or, or, or unit of uh, crop or wool or meat produced, what is your use or efficiency of use of resources such as water and nutrients and carbon and these sorts of things. What's the impact of the farm on biodiversity at a locally contextualized scale? So taking into account the landscape that you're living in. And these will be different. These aren't all represented in one table. There's a whole bunch of tables that, that make up these accounts like a filing system. We think they complement financial accounts to provide an expanded view of farm profits, not just a, a monetary one. And they broaden our consideration of, of farm performance by considering the impacts of natural capital and ecosystem function, both the impact of the farm production on natural capital ecosystem function, and conversely, how that natural capital contributes to the financial performance of the farm business. So we think there's seven key benefits of these accounts. They provide a direct line of sight from the natural capital assets on a farm to the benefits from production by being able to enumerate how those different uh, ecosystem assets are performing in terms of their, their agricultural production output. 
what are they producing in terms of kilograms of, of greasy wool or kilograms of meat or number of oranges or whatever it might be. We can complement other environmental um, economic accounting methods, such as the ecological outcomes verification method that land to market use in, in production areas, such as the econ's mission condition that um, uh, Accounting for Nature has developed, um, which are all great methods, but we can sort of provide a home for, for, for a number of them to, to provide a whole of farm assessment and a whole of farm vision. We hopefully they can be used to determine where improvements can be made to farm management to increase environmental health and sustainability and particularly to improve, to uncover opportunities where things can be done better through better management of the natural capital. The key one is to demonstrate the public benefit of maintaining and improving on-farm natural capital. So potentially opening up new income streams such as habitat credits, biodiversity benefits, as well as carbon, obviously is a, is a key one at the moment and stewardship payments and others will come in the future. Potentially cultural benefits, natural heritage payments, these sorts of things. We don't know what they are yet. Critically, it enables, as I started this, this uh, section on this, this presentation on, enables a farmer to communicate their environmental performance to a range of stakeholders, be that their buyers, be it their lenders, their banks, their insurers, and their, their potential investors. And you say, look, we are on a journey of improving our sustainability. You should be investing in us. We're a good, good farm to work with. And it does allow that pressure point to be visible right, uh, right throughout the supply chain to allow a collective whole of society management of resources. Now that's a bit idealistic, a bit utopian, but ideally that's where we're aiming for, that uh, a consumer can see their impact of buying uh, their, their packet of meat or their uh, packet of lentils right through the supply chain. And that price pressure can be applied to either repair degraded natural capital through disincentives and liabilities, or to uh, encourage uh, good management through fostering good stewardship and good custodianship of, of the natural capital on a property. So the finishing message is we, we, you know, we think natural capital accounting can contribute to saving the planet at least, but um, obviously reducing our reliance on fossil fuels would also be a good start. So thank you, I will leave it there. I think I've probably talked way too long. Um, uh, photo credits there, a whole bunch of people. I, I'm an atrocious photographer, so any good photos in here weren't mine. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Jim. Terrific. Um, I really enjoyed that. So now it's time um, for people to ask their questions. Um, if you've got any, there's been very little in the chat. They've obviously been glued to listening to you, Jim. Um, can I ask one question uh, to start off things? Uh, we know that uh, lime put on, um, on top of the pastures, there's been little effect of that over time um, until you get to five, seven, 10 years down the track with the top dressing of lime. Do you think that's the, that, and then you compare that to incorporating it in a ploughed paddock, is that what could possibly be going on with the compost? Um, yeah, possibly, as, as I said, maybe it's just, it, well, maybe a, there needs to be some physical manipulation, some physical incorporation of the compost into the topsoil. Um, and maybe they just, we just need uh, to allow more time for it to take effect. That's certainly um, one possibility. Um, yeah, uh, I, I really don't have a lot more to add. Yeah, it's certainly a possible thing. Yeah. That, I mean, we know that soil is very, very variable at small scale. So it's hard to detect change in it. And it is also very slow to change. I mean, it, it's, yeah. So question, uh, can you read that one there on the side? Which one? So um, interested sorry. about changes, amelioration to invertebrate pest control with increased diversification of land. I think farm accounting could, yeah, that's exactly right. Whoever, uh, Mariel, um, that's yep. a, a key uh, objective of our, Project. So I didn't talk about it, but we've got a, an extensive research project that's um, associated with the natural capital that's looking at um, diversity of a whole range of different invertebrates in, the, in different pollinators, different parasitoids, different pest control, um, uh, pest predators of, of various uh, invertebrate pests. So it's a key focus of us, of the project. And we're 
hoping to relate that at a paddock scale to, for example, distance from shelter belts or native vegetation or riparian vegetation, as well as looking at what's happening in the paddock in terms of the complexity of the pasture species or the, the, the fertiliser regime and hopefully build up a measure of um, uh, build up a measure of the uh, yeah the diversification the complexity of the, at a farm scale and, and whether that can contribute to the, the complexity of the invertebrate community which it probably does I think we're probably safe to say it probably does whether it actually has an effect on the pests is the is the next question and and that's the, the difficult one is there a, is there a production benefit uh, is there a cost associated with doing natural carbon uh, natural capital accounting Yes, there is. I mean, at the moment we're paying for it. The government's paying, you know, in our projects, I didn't mention it. We've got 50 farms that we're doing in this project. We're, we're producing farm scale accounts for 50 farms, uh, New South Wales, Victoria and Tasmania. And that's, you know, funded under our, our smart farming project. Now, we're also being approached left, right and centre by peak industry groups to come and do their, their natural capital accounting for them um, because they feel like they're, you know, they want to be in on it. Now, at the moment, you know, they're looking to fund that out of, um, out of, uh, you know, their, their industry body funds. But we hope that long-term, the, essentially, the accounts will pay for themselves. So a farmer will be able to, um, you know, they'll get, potentially get better rate, credit rates from the bank, better loan rates, lower insurance rates. They'll have access to markets. What happens when the EU says it's not just your carbon footprints that's important, it's your sustainability footprint, it's your biodiversity impact. You need to show us that you need to, you know, you needed a, a visible plan, a visible credited product uh, or, or process to, to demonstrate that. Otherwise, um, you're not getting market access. Um, so there's, there's uh a whole range of ways that eventually we think that these that the accounts will pay for themselves. But our goal is not to have farmers pay for it. Our goal is to have suppliers pay for it. So buyers want their products to be viewed as being sustainable. So they will underwrite the cost of making sure that that is visible to their consumers, that they're sourcing their products from a sustainable source. That would be the goal that, that, that the accounts would be paid for by the retailers, essentially. Uh, I wish to thank everyone for, for joining the webinar. And I'm just going to pause uh, 